Greetings everyone and welcome to THE 621 Lecture 9C where we look at Luke's portrait of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. As you will know from having read the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul dominates chapters 13 through 28. And indeed, almost every major Christian figure, for instance, the Apostle Peter, who figured so prominently in the first half of Acts, most of the others basically fade from view and Paul is the protagonist who drives the plot from this point forward. We also know independently from Paul's own letters and from other sources that Paul was an enormously divisive figure in early Christianity. Many Christians thought that Paul's apostleship was a sham, a fake apostleship, that he had no equality with the other apostles. After all, he'd only seen a vision. The others had trained with Jesus. Paul himself thinks his apostleship is equal to every other, and indeed, often he thinks that he knows better. In fact, usually Paul thinks that he knows better than everyone else. So we want to look at why does, why does the book of Acts give so much attention to Paul, and how does it portray Paul? How does Luke's portrait of Paul compare with the Paul that emerges from his own letters or from some, from some other sources? Now, ultimately, our interest here is going to be in Luke, in what we can learn about the narrative of Acts, more than in what we can learn about Paul. But they're, they're not unrelated questions. And one reason they're not unrelated is that there's been a perennial debate about whether or not Luke knew Paul, or only knew of Paul. And the most obvious reason to think that Luke did know Paul is the fact that he speaks in the first person in certain narratives that involve Paul. So although Luke does speak in the first person in, in the prologues to his two books, um, I investigated everything carefully, O Theophilus, and I've written this account for you, as soon as he's done with that preface, the narration is done in the third person, as sort of an omniscient third person narrator. Quite unexpectedly then, Luke speaks in the first person at certain points and always in points that are connected with Paul's movements. This really figures in Acts 16 and 17, and we'll note that uh, this author in the first person introduces himself uh, at, at certain points, like in, for instance, in Troas, just out of the blue, he says, we tried to cross. When did he join Paul's party? He'd been describing Paul's movements through Asia Minor. And all of a sudden, we. And then it ends about as soon as it starts. We tried to cross over to Macedonia. We set sail for Philippi. And once they get to Philippi, he then describes Paul's movements to Thessalonica, to Berea, down into Achaia, to Corinth. He doesn't he doesn't describe these uh, movements and events in the first person. He just says, Paul did this. Paul met with Priscilla and Aquila. Then someone named Apollos came to Corinth. Then when Paul gets back to Troas, we get the first person, we again. We were waiting to sail. Uh, they were waiting for us in Troas. We sailed from Philippi, blah, blah, blah. So you get the sense that whether this is a device on the part of the author or really Luke was with Paul as they sailed from Troas to Philippi, he did not accompany Paul down through Ikea. Now, what if we were to compare what Luke says about Paul in those movements in Asia Minor, down into Ikea, to Corinth, to Thess Thessalonica, and so on? If we were to compare what he describes there with Paul's letters? Well, to make a long story short, on the whole, Acts 17 and 18 match up really quite well with the people and events and cities and movements as they appear in Paul's letters. That is, as Luke describes it, Paul meets with the right people in the right places. He's got the same plans. People like Apollo show up in Corinth. Well, read First and Second Corinthians. Apollos is a figure who matters. So are Priscilla and Aquila, and so on and so forth. Of course, none of this proves that Luke knew Paul. Uh, Luke could have gotten these details right because he read Paul's letters and reconstructed them from Paul's letters. But the most straightforward interpretation of the first person sections is that the author Luke was a companion of Paul. Why then do so many scholars doubt that Luke knew Paul? 
Well, this is a more complicated question, but the basic answer is that they feel like the Paul that emerges on the pages of Acts is such a different figure from the Paul of his own letters. And most scholars have said, oh, there's no way he knew Paul. Otherwise, he wouldn't have represented him like this. And much of what we'll be saying in the rest of this lecture is meant to try to flesh that out, is to say, so what is it about Luke's portrait that makes people doubt that he could have actually known Paul in the flesh? I just want to say one other thing about this issue of first persons. Um, you will sometimes encounter it being said that it was a common ancient narrative device to just insert the, the first person as if the narrator of the story was involved in some points. Uh, that's really not true. So if Luke didn't know Paul, then these first person singular, these first person plurals are a problem, or at least they're an oddity. It's, it's not like it was a, just a regular convention of literature to make believe that you were involved in some parts of it. Historians didn't usually do that. They only included themselves when they were involved in the events. Now, if we wanted to sort of say things about Luke's portrait of Paul that seemed to not co co cohere with Paul's portrait of himself, exhibit A, and this is kind of an important one, would be Luke's conception of apostleship seems quite different from Paul's, and this is something Paul cared intensely about. So think about a letter like Galatians, where Paul opens with this uh, long and sort of truculent introduction of himself as an apostle, not sent by human beings or human authorities, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. And the whole point of 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 is for Paul to insist, my apostleship is as good as any other apostleship because God makes apostles. You see Jesus, you're an apostle, end of story. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians, he says the same thing in 2 Corinthians, and in 2 Corinthians, again, Paul is really touchy about this topic. I'm as good as any so-called super apostle. And Paul speaks sneeringly of the, the reputed pillars, those who seem to be something. What they were doesn't matter to God. Well, all of this bluster in Paul's letters, would, if, if Luke did know Paul, then Paul would be a little sad to see the way Luke describes apostles. Because if you recall in Acts chapter 1, the apostles conclude that they have to replace Judas, who's left his, his seat on the Council of the Twelve. Well, whom do they look for? They're really clear that to replace an apostle like Judas, you have to be someone who was with Jesus all of the days, beginning with the baptism of John. In other words, the only people who were possible candidates were people who knew Jesus. And that's precisely the attitude about apostleship that Paul tries to combat in his letters. So exhibit A, uh, Luke seems to take the more common view of apostleship. Yeah, there's other people who can be sent, who can be like kind of uh, second tier apostles, who can be, the apostle just means to be a sent one. But, you know, the 12 are the 12, and Paul ain't part of that. Paul wouldn't be thrilled if, uh, to, 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 if Luke did know him, Paul wouldn't have been thrilled by this, this aspect of the book of Acts. We'll sort of leave aside trying to debate, did Luke know Paul or did he not? We'll, we'll see it comes up again in the portrait of Paul's theology. But here I just want to note something almost on the other side of the ledger. And that is, as you think about the way Luke describes Paul's calling, Paul's vision of Christ, this probably does match up with Paul's, Paul's description of, of having, having seen Christ, of, of God having revealed God's Son to Paul. And some people have even gone a little bit further, in my opinion, probably too far. But there's something interesting here. Some people have proposed that one of the most distinctive things about Paul's theology is that Paul really thinks of all individual believers in Christ as members of Christ. And that word members is the same word in Greek as limbs, like the limbs of a body. And some people have proposed that Paul's theology in that regard comes from his calling. And the detail is that, in Acts, as, as in Acts 9, 
Saul, as he's still called in the book of Acts, is going along. He's going to persecute more Christians. He sees this light from heaven. He falls to the ground and he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now recall, who is Saul persecuting? He's persecuting individual Christians. He's just supervised the, uh, the martyrdom of, of Stephen. And Paul says, uh, who are you, Lord? And the answer is, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You could conclude from those two sentences, if you pressed them, that Paul is forced to make the deduction, when I persecute people like Stephen or other believers in Christ, I am persecuting the risen Christ. Ergo, to now quote from Paul, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And this is something Paul says again and again, and it's really central to his theology. So Paul says the body is, there's one body and it has many members. We're all members of Christ. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all are honored. Uh, did Paul gain that insight from this initial conversation with the risen Lord? I don't know how far you can press it, but it is interesting. I also just want to note, there's a sort of a poignant piece of narrative technique on Luke's part that Paul, well, Saul as he's still called in the book of Acts, who's such a bully and is dragging Christians off here and there and is seeing them put to death. Here when he sees this, this vision, he has to take the hand, he's blinded, and he has to take the hand of those with him. And his further education doesn't come by direct revelation. Rather, he's educated by being led to, to Ananias in the city of Damascus. So he has to learn sort of a humility and learn his place vis-a-vis -vis other believers. Another point where Luke's portrait and Paul's own letters have points in common, but perhaps also points of difference, is the question of Paul's collection of money for the poor in Jerusalem. This is something Paul talks a lot about. And in fact, it tends to be undervalued in Paul's letters. Every one of Paul's authentic letters talks about his collection for the poor in Jerusalem. He devoted a decade trying to gather this money from all his different churches and to take it to Jerusalem. It's a really big deal. To survey the data just quickly and to think about then how Luke treats it, we just note that in Galatians, Paul says, James and Cephas told us to remember the poor. Paul, ever touchy about his own independence, says, well, I was already eager to do that. So in other words, they told me, but I was gonna do it anyway. But Paul talks about this in all of his letters. He, so 1 Corinthians, instructions for what to do with money. Put it aside, I'll have it sent to Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians, all the churches of Macedonia gave out of their extreme poverty and they were gonna share in this ministry, this diaconia of the saints. Romans, and here's an interesting detail. He's in, in the book of Romans, Paul writes this as he's about to go to Jerusalem with this ministry, this diaconia for the saints. And for him, this is a theological issue. It's not just about charity. The Gentiles owe this money to Jerusalem. And although he wants to say Jews and Gentiles are kind of equal, he says, look, the Gentiles have shared in the spiritual blessings of the people of Israel, so they ought to be a to service to them in material things. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul says, pray that I might be rescued in Judea, that my ministry to Jerusalem might be acceptable to the saints. The thing to note here is that there's been a famine in Jerusalem in the 40s, late 40s. Times are tough. Paul is going with a big pot of money and he thinks it might be rejected. Why on earth would the believers in Jerusalem say, no, we don't want your money? Well, I think what Paul knows is on the horizon is that for him, the money he's bringing comes in a sense with theological strings attached. If Jerusalem, the center of the movement, accepts Paul's money from the Gentile churches, then they accept Paul's gospel, his law-free gospel, that all that's required is faith in Christ and baptism. And Paul knows they might say no. And now we turn to the book of Acts, 
And I think the general silence of the Book of Acts about this collection and this movement probably indicates that the money was not accepted. That Jerusalem said, no, no, we don't want your money, not on your terms. If we come to, to Acts, and I'll try to keep this relatively brisk, I just want to note that it's often said that Luke shows no knowledge of Paul's collection, and therefore that Luke couldn't have actually known Paul. Again, this is something Paul was spent a decade trying to do. How could you travel with Paul and not know about his collection for Jerusalem? But Luke's story does have these peculiar little details which perhaps do betray Luke's awareness of what? Well, of the fact that Paul, from chapter 18 on, is constantly saying he's in a big hurry to get to Jerusalem. And what's he doing? Just like Paul says in his letters, he's going to take representatives from each church when he brings the money. Come to the book of Acts. Paul was accompanied as he went to Jerusalem with Sopater of Berea, and Aristarchus, and Secundus of Thessalonia, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. He's got representatives of all the right churches going with him. The book of Acts never says why he's going to Jerusalem, or why he's taking these Gentiles with him. But that matches up with what Paul says in his letters. Furthermore, the book of Acts never explains why Paul is in such a hurry. So, the people in Ephesus want Paul to spend some time with him, but Paul says, no, I'm sorry, I really can't. I've got to be in Jerusalem by the time of Pentecost. Why? Luke never says. And there's just funny other little odd details. When, when Paul gives this farewell discourse, as it's called, in Ephesus, he says something that seems apropos of nothing at all. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. I worked with my own hands. By such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of Jesus Christ, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Why is Paul talking about money here? Well, what if we supply the blanks, the silences, and all these sort of mysterious things about Luke's story all of a sudden become clear? Luke's taking Gentiles with him because they're the representatives who have to present their own money in Jerusalem. Why is Paul saying to the Ephesians, hey guys, don't... Uh, I didn't covet anyone's money, well, because his collection was a really sensitive issue, and it really hacked a lot of the Gentile churches off, because they thought, Paul's a huckster, and he's taking our cash. What if Paul, as he leaves Ephesus, is, as it were, carrying big bags of money? Then, to say something about, I didn't covet anyone's money, I always worked, that's entirely apropos. Okay. So what I'm saying here is that it would appear that perhaps Luke does know what Paul was up to, or he certainly represents some of the details that fit. So what happens when he gets to Jerusalem? This event that Paul, when he wrote Romans, was scared about. They may not take it. Paul gets to Jerusalem, and nothing is said about bringing wealth, the wealth of the nations, to Jerusalem and supplying the needs of the poor. And as you know from how, from what we, we spoke about Luke and Acts and the theme of material possessions, it's almost incomprehensible that Luke wouldn't mention this if it had gone well. Luke loves the theme of the unity of all believers, and Luke loves the theme of sharing in material possessions. Uh, what could be, it's like served up on a platter for Luke to say, then Paul brought money, and lo, the church in Jerusalem rejoiced at the unity of the worldwide communion, and how the needs were met by the sharing of goods. It doesn't happen that way. Instead, Paul gets to Jerusalem. He goes to see James, who's the boss. And James says, Brother Paul, I've got bad news, pal. There's a lot of Jewish believers here. They like the law, and they hear that you don't. They've been told that you're telling the Jews to forsake the law of Moses and not to circumcise their children. I need you to do something about this. I need you to go make an offering. Paul goes and makes an offering, and it goes badly. He gets arrested, and that's it. That's the end of Paul's freedom. This has been explained various ways, this silence on Luke's part about him presenting an offering in Jerusalem. Um, 
I, I, I will say I think the most compelling explanation is that it went badly and that was too painful for Luke to narrate. It was too painful to say uh, this was a major fissure in the fabric of worldwide, this worldwide movement. And Jerusalem said, we don't want your money. There is just this one other note when Paul's making one of his defenses. He even refers to the fact that I came to bring alms and to present offerings. Again, you connect the dots. It looks like Luke knows what happened. Paul did try to bring money and it went badly. Let's change tack a little bit and look at Luke's depiction of the heart of Paul's missionary activity. Paul's going to cities everywhere. He has success as a missionary in various ways. And one thing Luke wants to do is show Paul as an incredibly versatile person. He's the person who can be successful everywhere from a little town like Lystra in Acts 14, which is in ancient sort of, as you think about towns, this would be proverbial as Hicksville. I'm not sure if that's an Australian expression. Imagine some pathetic little country town with uh, uneducated people who don't know up from down. And then Luke depicts Paul having success in Athens, which would be whatever the most prestigious intellectual university town you can imagine, the center of all learning and culture. And this is Luke's way of saying, Paul could do everything. Uh, he, he could have success in, in, in any place. And it's interesting to look at the way Luke depicts these encounters because he shows Paul using different methods in different places. So to take his events in Lystra in Hicksville, Paul, Paul and, 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 and Barnabas go, and the people are so cowed by their miraculous powers that they think they're gods, and they try to make a sacrifice to them. And this is sort of comical, and Paul says, friends, we're mortals just like you, we bring you good news, turn from these worthless idols to the living God, so on and so forth. And notice here that he appeals to a certain, what we might call today, natural theology. You guys don't have scripture, but you do have some witness from the living God. God left himself, did not leave himself without witness. Why? Because God gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filled you with food and your hearts with joy. And those basic common goods, food, seasons, the fecundity of the earth, and even joy in your hearts, those were God's way of giving a witness that there is a true creator God. So Paul appeals to what they can see. There's another sort of nice little trick that Luke employs here, and that is that he's appealing to a local myth at this point. So in the local myth, uh, you know, who, do, who, who do the people in Lystra think Paul and Barnabas are? They think they're Zeus and Hermes, or Jupiter and Mercury. And this appeals to, this plays off a legend uh, that you get told, for instance, in Ovid's Metamorphoses, which is a legend of, called the legend of Baucus and Philemon. And this takes place in Phrygia, roughly the right region. And Zeus and Hermes visit the locals in human form. And they show up in human form and everyone is quite inhospitable. No one gives them anything. Two humble people, Balkis and Philemon, share their resources, and then the gods, you know, strip off their human garb and reveal that they're really gods, and they destroy all the inhospitable, inhospitable people with a flood, and transform the this modest Balkis and Philemon's home into a temple of Zeus and Hermes, and they make them their priests. So, in a sense, what's happening in Acts 14? The, the locals are determined not to be taken unawares again. That is, once Zeus and Hermes visited in human form, people didn't treat them right and they got destroyed. This time, they see these, these people do something miraculous and they think, ah, quick, quick, make sacrifices. We don't want them to destroy us again. Uh, so Luke, with even out, without even drawing explicit attention to that backstory, it's a nice narrative trick. We come to Athens the center of all learning and culture, and Paul takes a different tack. He says, oh, I see, how, I see how religious you are. In fact, I found an altar which said to an unknown God. What you worship is unknown, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. He makes a little critique of altars and shrines. And then, quite interestingly, 
So he, he finds a point in common, and he doesn't say, oh, shame on you for worshiping an unknown God. He says, well, close, but I can do better. I can name that God. He then actually quotes a heathen, a pagan poet, and he says, you know what? You guys are close. Think about what your own poets say. In him we live and move and have our being, for we too are his offspring. And he says, yeah, that's, that's right. It's, it's not sufficient. It's not everything you need to know about God. But what your own poets have said, what is sort of basically common philosophical theology of the day, he says, this is right, and we can build on it. Um, just so you know, so this is quoting Eratus, one of the most popular poems of the day, actually. Paul takes this point of departure from human culture and says, it's not adequate, but it is a worthy vehicle. And what Paul does here is no different than what lots of popular philosophers of his day were doing. They would take something like uh, an image of God and say, well, God doesn't really have human images, but the images can be helpful in thinking about God as mighty or as uh, beneficent or something else. Now, one thing people have asked is, is this sort of natural theology you get in, in Acts 14 and Acts 17, where Paul says, God's made clear to everyone certain truths about himself. Is that consistent with the way Paul talks about God in his letters? Uh, it's a complicated issue. There's a lot of controversy about it. But I think the point of the one place where you get something close to this is in Romans 1, 19 and 20, where Paul says that God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. So. You don't get Paul developing an elaborate natural theology in his letters, but he does seem to think God has made some things clear to people, even without what we would now call special revelation, like an inspired text. The last thing we want to talk about is Paul's trial. Luke devotes an enormous amount of space to Paul's multiple trials, all after his arrest in Acts 21. And people have often looked to these as a clue for the purpose of the book of Acts. And one sort of, you know, obvious, but in my opinion, really misguided conclusion people have sometimes drawn is that the reason Luke devotes so much space to Paul's trial is because Luke, as an author, is trying to write an apology to Roman authorities. So Theophilus might even be a Roman governor. This word, excellent Theophilus, that he calls him, is the sort of honorific title that you would give to a governor. And hence, why is Luke writing this double work? He's trying to say to the Roman authorities, hey guys, Christianity isn't dangerous, it shouldn't be illegal, please don't persecute it. And so he gives Paul lots of chances to make speeches so as to show how innocent this, this, this new movement is, so Romans will leave it alone. I think the reason this is misguided is basically because Paul doesn't spend much time speaking to Roman authorities about the sorts of things Roman authorities would care about. So if Luke is writing this story with a Roman readership in mind, ask yourself, is this how you would want to tell the story? First, Paul gives a long defense to the Jewish crowds, and he does it in Hebrew. That's not going to reassure the Romans. Then Paul addresses the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. That's not going to reassure the Romans. Paul then starts explaining intricate prophecies to the Jewish king Agrippa. Again, Romans don't give a rip. And when Paul finally, after he appeals to go to Caesar, he never appears before Caesar. There is no climactic defense where you could have the emperor say, ah, now I see it's all okay. Instead, Paul meets with other Roman Jews. And the long and, and short of it is, nothing Paul talks about is really germane to the sorts of concerns Romans would have. Notice even when he does get to talk to a Roman, he says, I'm saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses have said would take place. Festus, the Roman governor, quite rightly says, Paul, you're out of your mind. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm impressed. You know, lots of weird, you know, Hebrew lore. But I think all your learning is just driving you insane. In other words, that's a reasonable response from a Roman governor. Why are you talking about the intricacies of your weird Eastern religion. I don't care. Paul then, and th this makes sense in the narrative, turns to someone who would care. He turns to the Jewish king, Agrippa, 
I'm not out of my mind. I'm speaking sober truth. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And Agrippa says, oh, easy, tiger. I'm not ready to buy all your stories just yet. The point I'm making, which I, I hope it, it is clear, is that let's imagine from Luke's perspective. Why include all these stories about Paul's defense? Whom are you really trying to make an apologia, a defense to? And I think the answer that emerges, if we look at what Paul talks about, is that Luke is trying to defend Paul. He's giving Paul these chances because uh, Luke wants to say, I know you've all heard nasty things about Paul, but they're not true. And who's he saying it to? He's saying it to the conservative wing of early Christianity. He's saying it to the conservative Jewish Christians who think Paul is a, a maverick who's rejected the law. Just notice that when Paul makes these speeches again and again, he says, I'm a Pharisee. I am part of the strictest sect of our movement. He rehearses his vision of, of Christ twice. No Roman ruler gives a rip if you saw an epiphany. None of this is germane to the legality of Christianity. What it is germane to, and look at the whole portrait of Paul, it is germane to Luke trying to clear Paul's name. Paul circumcises Timothy. That actually contradicts what Paul says in Galatians. Paul takes a Nazarite vow. That looks like Paul being a good law-abiding guy who does the things that Moses says. Paul says, I'm zeal when Paul gets to Jerusalem and James says, there's Christians here zealous for the law, Paul says, oh yeah, me too. Who vouches for Paul when Paul converts? Ananias, who's devout according to the law. Paul goes to the temple to pray as if that's just his normal pattern. Jesus appears to him there. And when there's this nasty episode with the high priest, Paul actually quotes the law as if that's his basic guide to life. Paul says, I'm a Pharisee according to the strictest sect. I worship God according to the law. He says, I only went to the temple after I had achieved purity. And when he gets to Jerusalem, uh, sorry, to Rome, he's going to say the same thing. He says, I, I never wronged the Jews or the temple. In other words, it looks like, although Paul is arrested by the Romans, the real trial, the real accusation that Luke wants to clear him of is the accusation expressed by the conservative Jewish Christians. Fellow Israelites, help. This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. And Luke does a good job. All the speeches make sense if that's what the goal is, is to clear Paul of this charge. There's one other way we can see this. And that is that the most radical aspect of Paul's theology and his letters is of salvation by grace through faith alone. And in the book of Acts, Luke accepts that theology, but he puts that theology on the lips of people whose credentials are unimpeachable. So for instance, it's either Peter or James who are the ones who say people are saved by grace. And in fact, Paul is never made to talk about uh, the power of salvation by faith alone. In fact, when Paul sums up his own gospel message, here's how he sums up his gospel message. I tell people to repent and do things worthy of repentance. Notice when he sums up his gospel message, it has nothing to do with grace, with freedom from the law, with faith. It's just, yeah, I've been telling people to do good. Uh, and that looks like, whose itch does that scratch? It scratches the itch of the people who've heard the very things that Acts 21, 28 talks about. We've heard you preach against the law. No, 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 you've got me all wrong. This, I think, coheres with the fact that for Luke, Luke really wants the entire movement to be seen as a faithful outgrowth of the Israelites. And so for Luke, like what even, even Peter, has to insist repeatedly that God gave him a vision before he ate with Cornelius. And Luke has James, that is the most trustworthy, conservative, law-observant Jewish person in the movement. He has James be the one who issues the apostolic decree. Luke only wants those um, slightly controversial decisions to be made by people whose credentials are unimpeachable. To wrap it up, we just note that the story ends in a sort of strange way. We've been following Paul's journey to Rome. He appealed to Caesar. 
he goes, he's going to get his trial. And we're never told what the denouement of this big uh, drama is. Now, he gets to Rome, he lives there for two years at his own expense, he welcomes all, he has some measure of freedom, and that's it. According to early Christians, they were divided about what actually happened. So Eusebius says that Paul was later released and then was martyred after that in Rome, according to an early document called the Miratorian Canon. He says that Luke only narrated his story this far because he only wanted to narrate the parts of Paul's life that he was personally acquainted with. You see the issue. If Luke is writing sometime in, let's say, the 80s, that's an average date most people would put for Luke and Acts, why does he end his story sort of abruptly, more or less the year 62 or 63? Why doesn't he tell the fact that Paul was martyred under Nero? Well, people have given various answers. It's possible that Luke was writing before the martyrdom happened. That's not widely accepted, but it's not out of the question. It's possible that, as the Miratorian canon says, Luke just didn't want to go any further. Most people think it's because he just doesn't want to end the story on a sour note, and so he ends with Paul having this measure of freedom. We'll bring this to a close. I hope you've seen that uh, Luke, in a sense, if we come back to the question, did Luke know Paul? In my opinion, the jury should be out. It's, it doesn't seem to me it's impossible. I do think it should be emphasized that the way Luke depicts Paul is quite different than the way Paul appears in his letters. And in my opinion, the best way to explain that, if Luke did know Paul, that's an if, is sort of the way you might write a biography of a friend of yours who was a constant firebrand. And you might write the biography almost to save them from themselves. And Luke is more of a peacemaker here and is saying, well, I, I don't think he always meant that thing he said. And yeah, it's true. He said some kind of uh, impolite things about the apostles, but I'm going to leave that part out and focus on his better days where he played nice with others. If Luke knew Paul, that's what that's the only way to explain it, is he's telling us about a side of Paul, partly that just doesn't emerge in Paul's own letters, and he's, he's kind of trying to do Paul a favor and leave out just how contentious he was. Alternatively, it's entirely possible Luke did not know Paul, and in that case, he may have gathered some information from Paul's letters, and he may be telling the story um, as he'd like it, like it to be, imagining all the apostles get along, Paul is accepted by the others, and tragically he was arrested in Jerusalem, but that God was working through him for the, for the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman world.